Okay, so uh, thank you, good afternoon, for asking me uh, to um, talk to you. Uh, my background is in education and health, uh, both uh, clinical, yeah, both uh, in the clinical environment, uh, uh, teaching, curriculum development, and uh, developing schools uh, at high education level, putting curriculum and governance structures around them. I have worked in Africa for the past 30 years um, at very different levels uh, from local level of empowering people to have a voice and put education and health frameworks around their needs as well as at uh, uh, high education and government levels, putting in a, a policy, a curriculum development and overseeing governance. I'm really excited about this partnership with African universities, because I think at long last, it provides uh, an area of need where we can come in and help supplement the roadmap. So I think that the roadmap is hugely important because using that, you can empower and uplift the whole of Africa. I think in Europe, we have very little idea of how big Africa is. And I think the reason for that is uh, that the way they draw the maps, Africa has always got to be smaller than Europe, where it's huge, um, 54 countries, and there might be more if you take it along lines of uh, uh, groups of people and how they function in communities. So with the roadmap, how do you then implement with actually quite a lot of obstacles? And you've heard both Prof. Bakri and Prof. Allen talk about electricity and how really, if you are going to make a difference with uh, both with higher education, and it doesn't need to be higher education in the way we think of it, it needs to have an Africa voice for it. Africa has really changed, right, over the 30 years. And in lots of areas, they are leading. And for instance, if you go to Kenya, they're very, very good at making apps, uh, implementing, uh, although people can't afford their very expensive phones, uh, the amount of things that people do on their phones are really important. So they were doing telephone banking way before we implemented it. And the one thing about African people, wherever you go, whatever culture they are, uh, whatever sex they are, they're really, really innovative. And the innovation comes from uh, poverty, from living near to the ground, uh, from having to supply your own needs. So if you look uh, about how climate change is actually affecting structures that are built on a Western model and how it affects structures built on a local uh, model, they're totally different. So we have to start using what Africa has to, uh, the gift they have to uh, give. Take that, what we have here in the West, the structures, we got lots of structures and governance which needs to be implemented and put this all in this platform. Um, I think you can't lose, right? And not only are you going to go to the best universities, the best research institutes, you also need to go to the local, their higher education institutes and make sure that everyone has a voice. So the way that this will work will encompass on a national level, not only medicine and education, but also uh, 
really the other structures that are really important around it. Um, and all of that through the universities. And one university that has a medical school, the other that doesn't, actually probably has all the science that you need to make the, the system work. So in 2015, presented a model of a framework through having uh, connections, both local and, dis and distant, uh, where you would have a platform which would drive and it would be connected to all HEIs as well as all hospitals and, and to, to make that work. And then again, the, the problem was, was electricity. I mean, you, you always in Africa, you're just on a telephone call to somebody, all the lights go out. You never know when they're going to go out. And what we did when I was with uh, the Royal College of Surgeons, we built um, a framework where we could run exams in Africa at four different centres, as well as in London at the same time, um, and managing around the power. So the American exams, if you're in the middle of doing it, uh, you'd lose all of it. But we developed a system that you could. So I took this to the United Nations as a model. I think part of the problem is that Europe has come into supporting or trying to work with Africa at a very late stage. And so it's going to actually be quite difficult for them. So the only way you can work is work with uh, structures that are already there, that are really good. And I think the, uh, the African university model is brilliant and it's been there for a long time and people haven't used it. Okay, um, you know, it needs a bit more funding. A lot of things can be done without, but actually funding is essentially uh, important. And together uh, we actually could do this. So I have a thing about localism, that the people decide what their needs are. You work with them to find out if you can develop those needs with them. You build in capacity, you put in a government structure, and then you uh, make it sustainable. And in the end, it has to run without you. And then that structure seeds other structures very like it. And I think by doing that, uh, you will see the excellence that is there, uh, mushroom. At the moment, there are absolutely excellent universities on par with any in Europe. But they sort of little ivory towers, they have a bit of mushroom out around them, but it doesn't go widely enough. With this platform, we'll be able to make sure that that comes like a big, what we call a mycetoma, that it has fronds that will go to the center and go out. Um, and then this, this thing is electricity and technology. What we did was to look at, there's all these fibers all around Africa, not being used. We also look, there are hundreds and hundreds of satellite stations not being used, which were put in by whichever country was running an African country. So they, they lying dormant, almost all of them can be used. And so we work through, um, there's a big satellite station here called Gunhili, um, to actually supply uh, uh, the ability uh, for people to uh, use uh, resource from here. Uh, so, and broadband is very good because it's mobile and you can take it everywhere, connect to the satellite. You can teach in a rural area, you can teach in a hospital. Um, and a good example of broadband was in Zimbabwe. They had 
uh, Siamese twins. They needed to uh, do an operation to separate them. And you could use the broadband by satellite to uh, have oversight and help from abroad. And the operation was done successfully. And that also says something else that we forget about, that the teaching in medicine, in dentistry, in engineering, in maths, is fantastic, right? And I think it comes from this innovation, uh, the way they teach uh, sort of inculcates uh, the really, really good groundwork. If you look here in London, a whole load of the big institutions are actually run by young kids that first came here from Africa that didn't even have matriculation. Okay, so you know that if you're good at doing uh, IT and techie things, uh, you don't have to have a formal education. And that's what the kids in Africa are good at. They're good at maths and they're good. So I don't think that the technology to support this will be very difficult. What we have to supply, it's the means for the technology to become sustainable. And I, I again say, you know, if you've got this organization, I, I just think it's the, uh, the most brilliant thing that we, organization we can work with. I'm passionate about the sustainable goals and have always worked with women and children and health. And I have in recent years saying, well, what about the men? All right, their health is very important. They all, they the ones that, uh, usually in Africa are the breadwinners. Um, not always, uh, but usually. So if you have education, you have your health, all right, you can change the world. So, so the one question that I want to yeah. ask, uh, Professor Alam mentioned yeah. about electricity and the internet, and you are repeating it. Yeah. Now, this is a very good initiative that you and that was yeah. and the Afri uh, African universities uh, organization are coming together. Yeah. How will you be able to in this implementation to work without involving governments? Because in Africa, everything is political. Absolutely. They, they will find a way of politicizing what you want to do. So how do you remain out of that political well, equation? For 30 years, I've been out of the political equation. And I think that you have to start with localism, work with like-minded individuals yeah, who can implement. And as I said, implement, support, sustain, move out, so that it's local, right? So these big questions then about government and their governance is not part of what you're doing. And I, and I honestly think that's the way, and, I, and that's how we have been working and how I've been working with WASTI and been working with lots and lots of diaspora groups uh, that you use the diaspora group to, um, and they make the difference. I mean, look at Ebola. You know, nobody worried that Ebola was killing people before uh, uh, all over Africa, from Mozambique right up to Middle Africa. It was only when uh, a foreign national developed Ebola that it became a huge thing. The WHO had a 110 page manual for treating it and they were very concerned because the local people weren't implementing it. Well, we used the diaspora group here and said you have two days to look at this, make it into 10 pages, make it what your school, your community in Africa would understand. By the second day in the evening, we were ready to go. 
and you we took I think there was about 40 of us everyone had to send it to 10 places a school a mosque or a church right a local group two people in your family by the next night somebody from New York rang me emailed me rather and said I now understand how you treat Ebola and it was actually when the local medics took it themselves implemented because they knew how people lived that it made a difference that was really really nice now in that area when there was COVID they said hey you know people from Europe are not going to come here and help us they built their own hospitals on the style that they needed that's the other thing there's load of institutions hospitals universities whatever built by really well-meaning governments in Africa the Japanese built a fantastic hospital in Zimbabwe well Africans are not going to go in there this is huge open spaces and nowhere where people could sit together okay it was also had these really expensive equipment which they didn't have the power to run so those are the things the mistakes that i think we have all seen and learned from and know that actually if you work at this level right nobody's shaking a hand at that level and to be quite honest it, it will make a difference and it has so last question yeah you have got maybe two uh, seconds yeah <laughs> Where do you see WASD and the African universities probably in two years' time? So let us have that space. I know yeah. people ask five. No, we no, no. To, yeah. I think where we are with the platform is way down to delivering. And how we work with the African universities will also be quite good we have very very strong networks already in a load of countries so the implement the facilitator for most of those countries will not be uh, difficult yeah could yeah. i just add yeah uh, you know we're really enthusiastic in west okay i've done loads of things uh you know prof uh, ahmed is fantastic. Prof uh, Bakri is superb. Can we go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> We've got all the enthusiasm. We're not going to go wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Okay.